you guys welcome back to let's go win podcast where we are here to help you be happy healthy wealthy get better every single day we're gonna be talking about a couple things today i think you will take great interest in we're talking about some money who doesn't love money we're gonna be talking about mindset we're gonna talk about women in leadership and is there differences between men and women in leadership It's a, we talked about this last week. It's it's a partnership. It, it gets to happen together. Yes. Well, I think it's actually a pretty interesting way to start because in my household, my wife is the CFO both of my business and of the family. Mm-hmm. The funny part about that is I've actually been CFO of a company and yet it wouldn't be something A, I, I enjoy and B, I don't think I'm very good at. Lisa's, her name is also Lisa. She's yeah. very type A, but it's like, I, I often people look at me like I'm crazy. What do you mean your wife does all the finance? Hell yeah, she does. Yeah. So I, I, that's my world. That That's how we operate. That's how we operate in my house too. I run, I run I, the show. Yeah. And <laughs> But it's funny, when I was in financial services, if I was actually going to the decision maker of the house when it came to money, Mm -hmm. I'm going to venture 90% of the time I was going to the female, not to the male. Mm. And yet, I will say in my neighborhood, it's it doesn't feel that way. So it's interesting. I don't know the dynamics, if it's different in different areas of the country. What are your thoughts? Well, I mean... Should there be one person over the other that should be doing it? And I can't wait to talk about spending guilt free because I think so many people, and we did talk about on your show, don't have a great uh, relationship with money. I certainly didn't when I, when I started, but Mm -hmm. is there someone specific that should be running the, the household finances? What are your thoughts? I think that in a relationship, in, in a framework that it work where it works is typically one person is running the finances, managing the finances, accounting for, you know, what's coming in, what's going out, all of that. And in a healthy way, the partner, male or female, needs to be in that conversation with the other person. Where I've seen it gone astray, and I'm sure you have in financial services, is when one person is managing it and the other person is not involved in any way, shape or form. There's no accountability. And we, we, that's where households get off track when one person is just not involved in any way, shape or form. And it's like this person's blind over here and this person's making all the decisions and running the show. Male, female, doesn't matter. You gotta be a partnership at home. Yeah, I think that's the communication piece that, look, no one wants to be surprised, especially when it comes to money. Like, oh shit, we don't have, that, that's a bad day. That's not gonna go well. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know how it gets there though. Like. I, I guess I do. I, you know, often people want to put their head in the sand and kind of like, no, it's not, that's not happening. Mm-hmm. But gosh, shouldn't we just be talking about, you know, I'm not saying have a super tight budget, but if that's what's necessary in the moment, you know, maybe we need to, or perhaps we don't take that specific vacation because we need to be stewards mm-hmm. of our finances for a moment. Uh, you know, where does that communication break down or, or, you know, is it because people, they don't want to face that fear of money? Yeah. 95% of our purchasing decisions are in the subconscious mind. Mm. 90% or more of our relationship with money is emotional. So it's all of the unconscious emotional conversations that we're having that we don't even realize we're having that get in the way of us making progress together financially because there's fear, there's shame, there's guilt, and everybody has their own financial set point, which we may or may not have touched on last week when we were together on my show, but with financial set points, 
if you were raised in a household where there was shame, guilt, anxiety, fear, scarcity, you may not have ever built the muscle to have conversations about money. And then it all just feels really overwhelming versus being in a household where there's a plethora of money, there's an abundance of money, not necessarily that there's conversations about money, but you didn't inherit a set point of anxiety, fear, guilt, and shame. Now, regardless of where, you, where your family earned or not, middle middle uh, america you know we did we always had food on the table no question about it however i had a very scarce mindset what's fascinating about this lisa is as i got into my professional life i'm an entrepreneur i i don't have a lot of fears when I, i'm just gonna go yeah and yet she grew up with again an abundance of money and she is the one that's like look i need x amount in my savings account to feel good yeah. I could have a dollar in my savings and I'd be like, eh, we'll figure it out. But conversely, when I was making, again, I said it on the show before, when I hit over seven figures, you in a year, you think like, oh, yes, confetti will fall. And you're going to feel great. I felt horrible because mm -hmm. I was taught money was kind of not bad. necessarily. Yeah, it was bad. It was for other people. Yep. And yeah. so we've had to talk about it a lot to be like, this is my relationship and I've worked on it. This is her relationship and how she feels comfortable with it. But we're not taught to have those conversations in college. We're not taught to have these, like, we're not taught about money often. You said in the home, is that where most of these conversations need to take place? Because it's certainly not happening at school. No, it's not happening at school because people have their own relationship with money, their own emotions with money. And a lot of financial educators want to attack money from a logical applied science kind of way. Here's what you do with your money. What I'm teaching out in the world is that before the age of seven, your limiting beliefs and value systems are all formed. So whatever is going on in the household, what's being said, what's not being said is five-year-old three-year-old, four-year-old Lisa is interpreting and making up what this stuff means to her. And so it has, it has to start in the household because the people that we learn from the most are our parents, whether or not they're around even. It's what we made up about them. They are the ones that we will learn from and print from. People that raised us, our grandparents, generational, you know, all those generational conversations. And we have to actively be in new, healthier conversations, but it does start at the home. We can't just send our kids to school and expect for them to be any different than us. How did you get into really being into this, this world of finances? Was, was this something that you were like, I really like money, so I want to educate myself on it? Or did you kind of fall into it and figured out, hey, this is kind of a big deal? Yeah, I fell into it. For sure. I was in higher education before I started in into the world of finance. So I, I've always been a coach, mentor, advisor. I've always trended toward those kinds of careers. But then I was the stay-at-home mom and I had to go back to work. My marriage was failing. My financial life was failing. My every, Everywhere I looked, there was failure in my household. So I was like, I got to go back to work. So that was the first thing. Like this, I need to go make more money. And then I got an email from... thousand dollars a year. My dad never made more than $60,000 a year. So to think that I can make that kind of money and still help people, that was the light bulb that went on for me. And that's how I found myself in financial services. That was the start of it. Unlimited yeah. earning potential. It is true. I mean, I'll vouch for it because, you know, I think they've said more millionaires are created in the financial space than any other. And I'll vouch for it. I mean, my family has been taken care of still is today because of that. Mm -hmm. Um, 
but it is interesting. And to go from the 56,000 to, and I don't know, did you end up pursuing farmers? Is that how you got into it? No, I called my best friend from, from like from like middle school who was my financial advisor. And she said, you know, Lisa, if you really want to work in the finance industry, come join me. And she was working in a high net worth firm. She's like, why don't you come learn how to be a financial advisor with me? And so I joined her, which was a whole different set of lessons for me. But that's where it started. Yeah. And it's a little more complex than just the insurance and annuity world. I'm imagining when you dove right into being a certified financial planner or investment advisor or whatever it was, you weren't, uh, I mean, it's, it's relationships clearly, but there's a hell of a lot of learning that goes into how our financial world works. Oh my God. It was, it was an insane learning curve and I'm a lifelong learner. I love learning. So I, I love sinking my teeth into finance so that I knew nothing about finance. I knew nothing about investments. So I got my series 65, which is the equivalent of an MBA and a law degree in finance. Like it's a lot of information, not just how to, not just how to make the right investments, but how to make sure you understand the law of how investments work. And this, I mean, this was after 2008, this was after the big explosion of the, you know, the whole finance industry. So they like, there were a lot of new laws and regulations and people were leaving the industry going to our an IRA model, which is more of what we're in now. So I was in the middle of all of that, which was really exciting. But also for the first time, I was around millionaires for the first time in my life. And when we talk about mindset, little Lisa from a blue collared family that grew up on a dirt road was a fish out of water trying to become successful and attracting millionaires into her life so that she could help them invest their money. What did I know? Well, I'm curious to hear what you did know, because here's the thing. Often in the financial service world, and this is in general, you're providing a value, you're providing a service. And if you don't let your limiting beliefs get in the way, you can attract and help these millionaires greatly. Just because they have money doesn't mean they're financially savvy. I know you learned that. And I'm sure you learned that extremely quickly. And it's so funny because as you're nodding, I, it's, I remember people not feeling worthy, not feeling up to snuff when the truth is these people don't know shit about finances. They may have made a lot of money, but that does not mean they're financially educated. Yep. That's exactly it. I didn't figure that out as a financial advisor because I was still combating and competing with my own limiting beliefs about being in the industry. And I had to get really comfortable with hearing no. And also, let's be honest, for me, this was 10 years ago. I look young today. I'm 44. So 10 years ago, I looked like a baby. So I was also getting hit on by all these guys, like trying to (laughs) trying to attract clients and bring clients in. And it was it was a battle of mindset for me at that time. And to that, to your point, when I became a coach, that's when I realized that there was a lot of work that all of us need to do on our financial mindset. And just because someone has money doesn't mean they know what what they're doing with it. And that for me has been the gap that I've been able to bridge with my clients is helping them work on their mindset first. Yeah, let's bridge that gap a little bit. You have a question in here that I'm really fascinated to ask it just because I'm curious on the answer. What is the stop budgeting system and how is it helping people? Everybody probably said, wait a minute, stop budgeting. I'm in because no, it's like saying taxes, budgets, people that is like cringeworthy the moment you say it. So everybody, if we can stop doing the budgeting system, what is that and how can we use it? It is, it is the system that every single one of my clients, when I start working with them goes through to get into a real relationship with their money. Hmm. And it requires anyone who comes into my stop budgeting course into my stop budgeting world to first and foremost, figure out where they are in their own relationship with money before we even talk about numbers. And then from there, do they really honestly know how to see their money in a way that is not full of anxiety and fear? And so the reason I take away the budget altogether is because 
that's the, that's what the finance industry has been telling people for years and years and years that they need a budget. And is it helping? No. We've got more Americans in debt than ever. We've got more Americans living paycheck to paycheck than not. It's not helping. So let's just take it away as a concept altogether and let's get really real about what's going on. And then I'm going to just very, very simply, because I need to keep money simple. And I think the more simple it is, the better. In a very simple way, teach you how to see your money so that you can plan your money so that you can grow your money. Everyone wants to be able to see their money so that they can plan it and then they can grow it in that order. That's the stop budgeting system. And that's a much more approachable way for money, in my opinion. So you immediately dive in with your clients and you're like, you mentioned little Lisa, you mentioned these, uh, I call them hard wires, the, the conditioning, whatever you want to call it, that we learned, we inherited. And we did talk about on your show, the generational stuff that I had that I took on as a, as a young kid. Um, I'm fascinated to see how, so they come to you and they're like, all right, cool. Let's, let's get into this. And you're, you're immediately going to like, what's your relationship to money? What is your emotions tied around money? And in the moment, I'm, I'm trying to put myself back when I had that crappy relationship. I think I, my initial reaction would be like, well, what are you talking about? I want to grow it. Hmm. But the truth is you have to eliminate some of these limiting beliefs to allow it to happen because money is just a thing. I, I, that's what's so funny about it. Why we have tied so much emotions into this tangible piece of paper, but yet it's true. And I was in the same boat. How does that go when you first start with a client? You're like, all right, what's your relationship to money or however your system that you get into it with? Them? Yeah. Well, I, I teach the five money personalities. I didn't make them up. My mentor, Robin Crane, put them together. But the very first thing we do is we talk about your beliefs and your behaviors. That's not budgeting, but that's the formula that whatever you believe about yourself and whatever you believe about money in the world is going to even unconsciously influence the choices that you're making every single day. So I need to know, they take the money type quiz. We look at what their money personality is. We, we talk about what lands with them, what's true for them. And for the first time ever, they're actually talking about how they feel versus what they think they should know. And the feelings game, 95% of our decisions are in the unconscious mind. It's all emotional. And so I can help someone say something that's their truth that they've never said. And that's, that's an aha. Like, oh my gosh, I've never realized that that's the reason why I do this, this, and this, or I've never realized that I've been holding on to this shame or guilt or pain for so long. And once we can release that, then we can actually start doing some work on the numbers. We've got to talk about that first. And so the very first question I ask someone is what's important about money to you? It doesn't matter what I think. Yeah, <laughs> let's do it. Like, it, it doesn't matter what I think, though. It matters what's important about it to you. Um, I'm going to go with what's important for money. Is uh, I'll go with security. I bet you hear that a lot. It's security for my family to know that that they're taken care of. What else? Um, that I have some, an, a little bit that I can go out and enjoy life. A little, I guess, discretionary. I'd like to, I'd like to have a good time, too. I love that. What else? I would say I, I would like for my money to work for me. I've, I've heard about, you know, money working for me. I, I'm not doing it very good, but I've heard it's a good thing. What else? Yeah, I love this. What else? What else? What else? And you go right? down this for a while, right? We do until we get to the unconscious answers because mm. those first answers were the conscious answers. And so you're digging into, because like you said, 95% of our decisions are made subconsciously. They're, they're just happening. They're just happening for a belief system, a value system. We got to break through those, those barriers to get to the real honest truth. Security sounds right. And I think at, at our most foundational level, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, we all want security and we all need security. But if that's all we're chasing in life, we're never... We're never elevating. We're never winning if all we're if all we're seeking is security. Yeah, I have. I imagine what you would have got to with me because my most important value in life is freedom. Yep. And I would have said, 
I don't like being told where I have to be, what, what I have to do something. I would like to be able to travel when I want, take care of my kids the way I want. I put that all into the bucket of freedom. But it took me a long time to understand that. You know, it's funny how the subconscious is is making these decisions, yet I didn't realize how important that that really was until I took a W-2 position and said, I don't like people telling me where to be. I don't like t- people telling me how much money I can make. That, that didn't go well for me either. No. So that's what you would have got with me is freedom. That's the most. So what I teach is how to be with your money in a way that it's flexible and it moves with you. It doesn't hold you back. It doesn't hold you into a particular area that you can move with it. And I teach people how to see and plan their money forward. That's really missing right now in finance because most of it's looking back in the rear view mirror, even business finance in a lot of ways. So how can we start planning forward and see that we will have freedom and know that we will have freedom and be flexible because you have kids. I have kids. Things change on a dime. I want to talk about the the going in the past because I, I see not zero. I see very little value in looking back and saying, oh gosh, I sure made a mistake in the stock market there. I, I'll give you a real example, blew over a million dollars on a, a business there. be ashamed. Those unresolved negative emotions hold us back from having what we, re- what we really want in life. Someone might also say they want freedom, but are they really, are they really capable and willing t- to, to cut, you know, to take with them what comes with freedom and the cost of freedom? Are they will- really willing to take the risk and have the conversations that they need to have? not ruined, but in the moment they're like, I am financially ruined. I don't know how I'm going to go on. I watched a business partner go through three of these. Now he had a very abundant mindset. Like I'll just make up more. And he always did. But if he had stayed in the past, oh my gosh, like the millions and millions of dollars that he has been separated Mm. from through divorce but I don't see that as being the common trend. Typically, I, I hear so many of those, I was ruined, and they stay in the past about the divorce. Mm-hmm. What were you able, how were you able to kind of, because I know this was right as you were getting into it too. So this is a really interesting time for you to choose this path. Yeah, I I had to blow it up. I had to blow it up. I had absolutely nothing to lose at that point. I had done what good girls do. I had followed the path. I was student body president in high school. I was homecoming queen. I was a great, you know, straight A student. I followed the path. I did what I thought I should do. I got a college degree. I got a good paying job. I got married at 25. I had a kid at 28. I did it 
all right, air quotes. <laughs> and I woke up at 33 and I was miserable. Mm. And I was at war with myself and I was not living an authentic life. And I chose to blow it up because everything that I was doing to stay on the good girl path wasn't making me any happier. It wasn't making me any or any more money. I was actually failing. I was a financial advisor pulling money out of my IRA to, to keep my, ho my household afloat, to keep my marriage afloat, to keep my business going forward. And I had to take that look in a mirror and thank God I did to go, you know what? None of this is who I am and none of this is working. And so I rolled the dice on myself playing to win. I didn't know exactly how that all, was all going to turn out. But at that point, I had nothing to lose. But I had a belief system on, in myself. I know how to be successful. I knew how to be successful. And I wasn't figuring it out here in this point in my life. But I knew I could be successful. So I had that belief through so many failures of, of my own in life, you know. And then I jumped in all in. And that's when everything turned around, but it did require me to go, all right, you know, I'm going to lose the marriage. I might even lose my parents and my relationship with my family at this point because they didn't support me, but I'm betting on myself this time around. I'm going to do that. I would argue that you wouldn't have been successful financially unless you, again, uh, had left that unhappy relationship. I was. This is yeah. Yeah, because people may not want to hear this. It is so extremely difficult to be crushing it financially and relationship-wise and health-wise unless you truly find happiness. And if it was truly not meant to be, which it wasn't in your case, that allowed you to be free enough to pursue everything you want. I've seen very few people that can be miserable, stuck in something and really succeed in every other way. So I think that's, that's probably what you had to go through. I'm guessing you probably see it that way as well. I do. I was holding on. This is, you know, to your question about holding on to the past. I was holding on to my identity and my fear of failure. And that was what had me in a really toxic marriage for a long time. And as soon as I was willing to just let go of that, everything opened up for me. So to the point of holding on to mistakes, what if we just saw them as lessons in terms of winning in life? I think that is one of the best ways to reframe failure is it's just a lesson. Learn how to become resilient. And financially, a lot of people haven't ever learned how to be financially resilient because they have a belief that their money's never coming back. They never were going to have money in the first place, but it's never coming back. So we have to teach financial resiliency as much as anything else. Isn't that fascinating that if you were able to attract, and I mean that with very strategically, I'm saying that word attract. If you were able to attract that money at one point, how I, this is, I, I don't have an answer. I'm asking a question. Maybe you have an answer. If you attracted it once why you wouldn't think you could do it again and again and again and again i watched a business partner do this where he attracted lost it attracted lost it attract but the key is he could always do it again yeah and that's that's where i don't understand and i guess it's just a scarcity mindset that i got lucky i was an imposter somehow i just i got this money but it's never going to come back to me again yeah. You say it out loud and it's like, that's fucking stupid. But to them, that that's their truth. That's their truth. I think that that's a big distinction between an entrepreneurial and growth mindset and a fixed or W-2 mindset. If you're a W-2 employee and you do the math, there's only a certain amount of money you're ever going to make as a W and two employee, if you don't find other ways to make money, the greatest gift I ever gave to myself was learning how to go out and make money, hmm. literally go out and make money, how to put offers together, how to, how to sell it, how to attract business, how to market myself. My club, my, my mentor at the time, she said, Lisa, if you learn how to make money, you'll learn how to make money for the rest of your life. 
collecting a paycheck is not the same as learning how to go out and make money. No, very true. The grace that you gave yourself, I, that, I'm sorry, I'm coining it that to say, look, I was the good girl. I got the straight A's, the, the homecoming, like I followed the path and it led me to being unhappy. Yeah. I'm guessing that you had to find a way to, to, you said identity. So you, you clearly shifted that identity to say, look, that wasn't serving me. Although this is all the things that people told me to do, or this is what I thought would lead to happiness. That's, that's, that was BS for me. It didn't work that way. Yeah. Did you have to forgive yourself? I'm guessing to say it's okay. And, okay. and you know what, Lisa, it doesn't have to look any certain way. This is my life. This is not mom and dad's respectfully. This is my life and I'm the only one that gets to live. So I got to look in the mirror and be really proud and happy with the life I'm leading. Over and over and over again. It's not a one time and done conversation. Actively, consciously investing in myself, hiring coaches, getting certifications to work on myself first and foremost, and over and over and over again, forgiving myself so then I can forgive others. It's not the other way around. Mm. How is that relationship now? I, I'm, I'm going to guess it, mom and dad are good and it's like they're proud of you. It's, it is funny how we create this idea in our head, but mom and dad just really want us to be happy. At the end of the day, that's what parent, you're a parent. What do you want for your kids? Be happy, right? Yeah. It doesn't have to look any such way, but yet we, you had created this idea that mom and dad probably aren't going to be very happy with me because I'm blowing up the, the, the relationship. But the truth is in your next relationship or, you know, whatever they're, they're seeing their little girl happy. And I'm guessing that relationship has never been better. Never been better. But it started at a young age with me. I grew up Southern Baptist. My dad grew up in Georgia. You did things a certain way. You lived life a certain way. And I started testing those boundaries at a very young age. And in three separate occasions in my life, my dad threatened to disown me. Hmm. So I had to learn, one, if I wanted to keep my dad, that was the conversation I had at a young age. If I wanted to keep my family, I had to do it his way and get his approval. And then I just was exhausted at a certain point. I was like, I got to live my life for me. That's when things turned around for me. It got ugly <laughs> for a minute. It got real ugly. I've got stories for days about the stuff that I put myself through to be able to walk through my dark to get to where I am today. And yes... My relationship with my parents has never been better because I had the courage for myself to do what I need to do for myself first. It's been an expensive journey. It hasn't been all sunshine and rainbows, and it's been a thousand percent worth it. Well, to uh, Lisa's dad, I apologize for the cursing being the Southern Baptist, but at the same <laughs> time, I'm, I'm unapologetically me, so uh, I hope you enjoy the show otherwise. Let's, yeah. I want to talk about women navigating leadership because um, obviously you took a huge bet on yourself. You, you said, I believe in myself. You started by leading yourself first, mm -hmm. which is huge. Like you don't, you can't lead anyone else until you lead yourself first. But specifically to the question, what are you seeing with women in leadership today? And again, I know you coach both, but you, you do have a focus on females. And we talked a lot about that on your show. And, and I expressed to you like, yes, you came, especially in the financial world, male, pale and stale. Like that is a <laughs> white dudes and it's changed a bit, but it's still like there are a bunch of guys that look like me. Um, but what are you seeing with the women in leadership today? Well, the, the number one reason people come to work with me is because of money. So I'll keep it in that lane that women in so many ways, we're figuring out who to be in corporate America. We're figuring out how to negotiate. We're figuring out how to navigate business in a feminine way. We're taking off some of the the masculine stuff that we had to wear for a long time in business. And I do believe that women today are learning more how to be women in business. And I see, we're seeing a lot of wins and success because of that. We've got more women in Congress. 
We've got a female vice president. We've got more women that are uh, CEOs of Fortune 500 companies today. We've got over 12 million female business owners. We've got women across the planet who are making a big difference. We're winning. We're learning how to win our way. And financially, there's still a big gap. And the number one reason the women in business come to me is that they feel like they've got it figured out in every other area but finance. Mm. So we have a learning curve as women to learn how to champion ourselves and ourselves at home financially, as well as become leaders financially. And I'm here to help bridge that gap by having healthy, open, honest, vulnerable, transparent conversations about money. Is it a systemic challenge or is it so often, I'll use my wife as an example, she put her career 100% on the back burner, had the kids, decided to stay at home. That's obviously taken away. Let's let's say for her that was, I don't know, that was almost five, six, seven years that she completely stopped being in the professional world at all. Is it a systemic challenge or is it a little bit of both? I'm just curious because... I don't know that answer. I'm, I'm curious from your vantage point, is this something that, gosh, if I took seven years off going back, yeah, period. <laughs> yes. <It is. laughs> Women for since the beginning of time have stayed home to take care of our kids. We have to figure that out. Other countries are. Other countries are figuring out ways to support women who can retain their jobs and stay at home longer and win financially or otherwise. We haven't figured that out in the United States yet. And for women who do want to be mothers and also corporate women and business women, we have to figure it out. Because for me, even taking three or four years off to stay home with my son, I came back and the world was different. Business was different, and I entered into a new industry at the same time. I also think that's why entrepreneurialism is rising for women, because we're just deciding to start businesses and grow financially outside of corporate framework because of that. Because if we're going to take five, six years off to get back into corporate America, you got to take a step back. And the world is moving so fast technologically, there's a huge learning curve there. We have to figure out how we can retain women in business and also have happy, healthy homes. Yeah, there's definitely a lot on, on the plate, especially I, you and I talked about on your show, especially when females take on so much at home Mm -hmm. before they even go to the job, before they even consider taking care of themselves. No question about it. I will say this, I think, and I've told this to my wife many times, the one thing that I like, the community that when women truly rally around and support that, I think they have an advantage over males. I really do. And I'm not, again, that's a generalization because there's certainly catty women out there that don't support, you know, you said I look young today and every woman is like, screw you. You know what? (laughs) But, but I will say, I think, when you have something that when women can really empower, like that's an awesome product. I'm going to support that. I think that's an advantage that females certainly can have when they're speaking to the Mm -hmm. right audience. And I love seeing more women be entrepreneurs that way, because I've told my wife, I'm like, you can rally a group. You guys come together in community, whether it's a, a, Tupperware party, it's a makeup thing, or it's just yeah. a wine night or a book club, differently than guys. And the crossroad of being able to talk some business while having wine and talking about the kids, guys don't do that as much. I think that's an advantage that women can absolutely take uh, take full advantage of. I agree. I agree. I mean, that's how NABO started. I don't know if you know the history of NABO, which is the National Association of Women Business Owners. It started at a coffee table of women business owners who didn't have the same rights that men did in business. We couldn't, we couldn't until the seventies even get our own access to credit without a man co-signing for us. Hmm. So that's the only thing that's ever changed history. Women, men, communities coming together 
and activating around something. Women were, were meant to be, were born to be in community. And we went through a dark period in our country where women were separated and segregated out, not working, living at home, taking care of kids. We're pulling it back together. And I think everybody's going to win because of that. Yeah, there's no doubt about it. It's uh, it's the stronger sex between the two. Let's just be honest. Maybe not physically. I will tell you in so many other ways, 100%. I want to give you just... I. I'm sure there's a question I didn't know enough to ask you that you're like, Jam, I want to make sure to get this to the audience before we wrap up. What is that question? I should have known to ask you and then feel free. Uh, I think you, you talked about the guilt-free spending at the top of the hour. And I think that's a really important distinction because distinctions really matter across the board in our life. The reason I'm championing guilt-free spending is that we will have a freer relationship with money when we can all give ourselves permission to spend. The finance industry, I'm on Instagram all day long listening to, paying attention to what other financial experts are saying. And the dominant conversation in personal finance is save, 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 save. And now it's moving to investing for women. In order for us to do that, we have to have a healthy, holistic relationship with money, which means that we need to give ourselves permission to spend and enjoy spending. Because if we didn't, what would happen to the world today? Women spend 85% of the world's wealth. Wow. It comes through our fingers. It comes through our hands every single day, all day long. We're making decisions for the household. Let's enjoy it. Let's stop sabotaging ourselves. Let's stop beating each other up. Let's stop... Uh, judging each other and shaming each other for our decisions because a healthy world is when when our economy is working and moving and women are moving a lot of money so let's try we got to transform our relationship with spending all together so that we can all have what it is that we say we want and that's freedom that's time that's enjoying our lives i will say when i think of the most uh financially successful people i know that that is hundreds of millionaires and in into that fringe billionaire. I don't know that I know anybody that's like billion billionaire, but fringe billionaires. I don't hear save from them. Very, very, very seldomly. Do you hear the word save reinvest, make help your money work for you. You hear that a lot. Mm -hmm. I don't hear save, tighten up, put it under the mattress. That's old school nonsense. You're not putting in the coffee cup or the coffee, the Folgers thing on top of the fridge. That doesn't yeah. work. You're literally losing money at, at the inflation rate. You have to reinvest. Yeah. And I think that's probably what you're saying is like that. Don't feel bad spending that way. That's a good thing. I love that. Yeah. Lisa, if if the audience, men, women, anyone wanted to reach out and like, love, I need some help with my financial situation. My mindset is not great. They yeah. want to connect with you. Where's the best place to do it? LisaChastain.com. There it is. Yeah. She's so direct. This is why she's good at her job. She's like, nope, LisaChastain.com. <laughs> she's just right to the point. Uh, I love it. You're you're awesome. I love what you're doing. Keep it up. I Creating more abundance and freedom. All the things that, like you said, that's how our economy is going to succeed. That's how we're all going to be happier. I told you guys, happy, healthy, wealthy. So uh, thank you for coming on today. I appreciate it. I'm so grateful to be here, JM. Keep rocking it. Uh, this is the only thing I love doing. I love it. I will do it. And uh, thank you for having me on your show earlier. Check that out as well. Yep. Uh, you guys, go to lisachessing.com. I promise you, like I said, whether you're male, you're female, we have these relationships with money. We don't communicate enough or probably effectively enough with our significant other. Have the conversation, take the quiz, see where you stand so you can get better and live a happier life as well. Until next time, remember your mindset matters. I appreciate y'all. We'll talk to you soon. Hey.